So my role here is just to welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see uh, so many um, uh, virtual, um, uh, to see such a, such a robust virtual attendance to our special seminar on social equity and racial justice. And what I'm do, going to do here is, I'm Kimberly Gray, the Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering, is that I'm really gonna throw this over to the people who do the real work. And so um, Professor Amanda Satopoulos is going to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Mimi Scheller. Um, and I know that we're all, I think I speak on the behalf of, of all those in attendance that we're really excited to hear today's seminar. So I'm gonna throw it to you, Amanda. And thank you so much, Mimi, for, for, for visiting us. Of course. Yes, uh, welcome everyone. This is the second talk in our series, newly installed series of social equity and racial justice seminars. We're trying to bring our department together and focus on issues related to equity, justice, and uh, how pervasive this is in our profession, but we don't always spend time reflecting on it and, and, um, and analyzing it. So. So I really appreciate this opportunity to soon hand over the mic to our speaker, Mimi Scheller. She's the professor of, uh, she's a professor in the Department of Sociology, head of uh, the sociology department and founding director of the Center for Mobility Research and Policy at Drexel University. Uh, over in Philadelphia, she assures us she also has some snow there. So we feel some kinship. Um, she has founded a, a wonderful journal called Mobilities. If you're interested, uh, you should look it up. Um, and has led the, the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic and Mobility and served um, as co-editor for uh, uh, many other journals. We just learned that she is uh, also co-editor of 15 books, not 12 like I had in my notes. So it's, it's ballooning in, in just uh, this recent short time. Uh, particularly interesting related to this seminar is Mobility Justice, the Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, so I don't want to hold up uh, too much. You can read more about her accomplishments in the bio, and I, I'm really excited to hear your, uh, to hear Professor Scheller's talk and to learn more about the inter interdisciplinary area of research that we love uh, around mobility, and uh, learn more about how to transition towards more just mobility and how to make these connections to uh, the, the pandemic age and hopefully soon the post-pandemic age. Uh, so we're very excited to have you here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Kimberly, Amanda, Joseph. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all. And I'm going to share my screen where I have some slides. And can everyone see that now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me go to full screen. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've um, been thinking about mobility, mobility justice for some time. And in, in this case, I decided to speak about it in relation to both the pandemic recovery and to sustainable mobilities as a, a question of, of sort of transition. What, are, what, what futures are we transitioning towards? And some of what I'll talk about today draws on, um, there's a new special issue that I co-edited of, of the journal Mobilities with my other co-editors on what we call pandemic immobilities with a parentheses around the Im, immobilities, mobilities. Uh, so um, some of the talk will relate to that, but I also am gonna bring in some new material um, that's very more recent because uh, of, you know, thinking about what would be of interest to engineers and um, civil environmental uh, and just broader urban planning. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Philadelphia and our new, um, transit plan, which was just announced on Monday. So I'll get to that at the end in case anyone's interested in public transit systems. So to begin with, I'm gonna um, talk about our response to the pandemic and our hopes for recovery and the way they're deeply dependent on how we deal with problems of what I call mobility justice. Mobility justice challenges the forms of power and inequality that are embedded in the governance and control of all forms of movement. It's, it's about the control over mo diverse mobilities as a form of power that I argue has deep historical roots in colonialism, in racial capitalism, in you know, the, the um, settler societies that we live in, as well as more recent aspects of automobility. 
So my argument that I'll be presenting is that pandemic recovery and sustainable mobility transitions will only succeed if we can overcome the existing systems of mobility inequities through more just mobilities. So basically like the answer to both of these problems, sustainable mobility, pandemic recovery, economic recovery, and racial justice is that we need more just mobilities. That's kind of the heart of my argument. Um, so as you, I'm sure everybody now knows uh, that the uh, groups most likely to have contracted COVID-19 uh, were people of color. Um, and in particular, Black African-American people were most likely to have died from COVID-19. You can see the statistics here as of uh, February 21st. And, you know, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders had the highest number of cases per 100,000 people. Uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives, next Hispanic Latinos, Black African Americans, then whites, then Asians. Um, and you can see the uneven distribution of deaths per 100,000 people. So in thinking about that, I mean, there's lots of reasons for the social determinants of health. And um, I'm, I'm not an expert on social determinants of health, so I'm not going to try to sort of give that argument. But behind some of that, I think are issues related to uneven mobilities. So as the coronavirus swept around the world in 2020, it outpaced public health efforts to contain it and many everyday human mobilities were brought to an abrupt halt and others had to be drastically reorganized. These viral mobilities have unleashed not just a disruption of human mobilities, but also a vast intensification of existing uneven relations of mobility and immobility. And that's the first point I wanna make and I'm gonna talk about that a little more. Sorry, I'm getting strange sunlight coming through my window. I can't quite adjust that. There we go, that's a little better. So in the face of a pandemic, normal social practices were disrupted and new material assemblages and temporal patterns emerged. Many people stopped going out to work if they were able to. Those who were deemed essential had to keep going to work. Others were sent back to rural villages, for example, in India. Children were kept home and struggled to learn online. Many businesses closed their doors while others had to reorganize their work processes. Airplanes more or less stopped flying to a large degree. Airports were emptied out after the initial rush of people heading home. Cruise ships were turned away from ports and uh, left moored at sea, often with their workforces stuck on them. Borders were closed. Many factories stopped churning out um, inessential products and the global shipment of goods slowed to a trickle, including fossil fuels, which uh, as we know, the, the sudden drop in demand led to a, a price fall and then um, the need to store lots of oil uh, in tankers out at sea. As each affected region in turn has imposed social distancing measures and lockdowns on travel, those who are privileged enough to have safe and secure homes find themselves confined to their homes in which they must reassemble the means of work, health, reproduction, and survival. The standardized regularity of clock time has been interrupted by the real-time impact of viral transmission, sudden illness, and the cruel uh, endpoint of lonely deaths for many people. And I want to acknowledge, you know, that the United States has just passed the 500,000 mark, and it's really um, hard to take in those numbers. When the government of India shut down cities during the pandemic, millions of people were forced to leave the cities, many having to walk home to their villages um, without the means of transportation. In this great expulsion of people from informal settlements, perhaps we see the kind of future that might come with climate change in mega cities that are both attractors of vast populations in informal settlements, as well as systems for managing population mobilities. On the heels of the global slowdown, there has also been a shift to many new kinds of mobilities. So essential workers having to get to their jobs, streets being opened for biking and walking, evacuations and repatriations of travelers, 
So it wasn't just a you know, stop to mobility, it was a reorganization of mobilities and new logistical processes. At the heart of many of these transformations are complex intersecting systems of mobilities and moorings from everyday travel by households to the provisioning of urban supplies, to the transnational mobilities of ships, airplanes, and people across borders, to the planetary mobilities of the virus itself and ecological systems. Within the field of mobilities research, we've especially focused on the ways in which differential mobility empowerments relating to who can travel, when, where, and how always reflect structures and hierarchies of power as uh, I argued in the 2006 article, Mobilities, Immobilities, and Moorings uh, with Kevin Hannum and John Uri. A mobilities perspective on these complex heterogeneous systems focuses attention on their dynamics and dynamism, including how those prevailing structures of power are themselves active. So I also want to point to um, the, the inequality of these mobilities and the inequitable transport infrastructures and what some call transport racism in the United States, which is part of what drove the racially uneven exposure to the coronavirus, as well as sparking the, black, the reignition of the Black Lives Matter protest movements last spring. Unequal mobility regimes are the basis of racial and class-based inequities, health disparities, and segregation which have now become a life and death issue. So how can we recover from this pandemic mobility disruption in an equitable way that does not simply entrench the inequalities more deeply and also supports low carbon transitions and mobility justice at the same time? Uh, and here we see you know, the Black Lives Matter protests. And you know, this, for some people, it, it came as a surprise that these erupted in the midst of the pandemic, but from a mobility justice perspective, it makes perfect sense that, that, that this uh, question of um, bodies, streets, freedom of movement, carceral states, police violence, were all caught up in this questions of the management of mobilities and immobilities in the United States. So I wanna to turn to thinking about um, the new material and temporal assemblages of everyday mobilities that are emerging and sort of thinking through how those might be uh, changed or shaped in different ways. Crucially, during the pandemic, we began to see the impacts of the global slowdown of fossil fuel consumption and um, this kind of seizing up of transportation, including, you know, like a 90% drop in the use of public transportation in major cities. Um, as well as the international you know, travel shutdown, the, the drop of tourism and visitors and the sort of collapse of fossil fuel prices, that for some policymakers, this dramatic emptying of city streets prefigures a world in which we have reduced the dominant system of automobility and fossil fuel dependence. Suddenly the streets were opened up for walking, biking, and maybe for more rapid public transit across many cities and towns worldwide, um, from Europe and the UK to Latin America and even the US, local governments responded to the lack of car traffic um, and the continuing fear and avoidance of, of public transit to introduce new bike lanes. Whether these were temporary or seemingly permanent, we saw, um, for example, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris with the um, the incredible expansion of bike lanes in Paris, but also in cities like um, Bogota and Mexico in Colombia and Mexico City, the uh, ciclovias were expanded and made more permanent. So this raises um, this question, uh, as countries seek to recover and pull out of this mobility shock, will we return to the high mobility, high energy, high carbon economy of the past? Or will this actually kickstart the transition away from fossil fuels? How can we begin the urgently needed shift to a low carbon transportation and low carbon economy premised on more resilient, regenerative and circular forms of exchange? 
So this is one of the, the sort of intersections of you know, the pandemic and the, the climate and sustainability issue is sort of what, what sort of futures are we planning coming out of this? But within that is this crucial issue around um, mobility justice, bicycle justice, urban transformation and race. And this conversation has been going on you know, well before the pandemic. And I put here a few examples of um, Adonio Lugo's book, Bicycle Race, Transportation, Culture and Resistance. Um, examples from Chicago of you know, bicycle equity events and bicycle justice um, events that have been you know, going on for some time. While the lockdown um, of travel reduced car traffic and car-based air pollution, ironically, it's, it's been public transport that it seems to have been most hard hit by COVID precautions and concerns and possibly has forced more people back into their cars especially because communities began conducting a lot of things by car, right? Drive-in virus testing, um, using car parking lots for all sorts of different activities to drive up, drive-in restaurants, et cetera. And in this, in this way, then we also see a reversal of the shift towards more sustainable travel modes. There seems to be an increase in used car sales as people avoid mass transportation. And we're starting to see this revalorization of the car as a mobile but isolated safe cubicle or, or sort of bubble for travel. So while some might see this as the wrong time to be worrying about sustainability and climate change during a health emergency that needs an immediate response, as well as this kind of economic recession that seems to be lingering, for others, these two things are intimately connected. Our societal responses to COVID-19 share crucial elements with our needed response to climate change. And our failures to contain the virus, which you have to say the United States has failed, may foreshadow the failures of governance that climate change might also set in motion. Or arguably even worse, the failure of governments to learn from these failures, right? We've had a chance, we should have learned from this, but um, the, the questions of inequity in the United States seem to haunt our ability, our cap capacity to respond politically and through government action in appropriate and effective ways and to learn from you know, what, we're, what we're trying, learn from the evidence. Instead, we are getting locked into these political battles. So above all, it seems to be coming clear that the response to both the coronavirus and to climate change share common elements. Proponents of the Green New Deal in the United States or the Green Deal in Europe have been calling for a massive transformation of our energy infrastructure, housing and transportation systems through public investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency and low carbon transportation. And many believe that this massive economic disruption of the coronavirus offers us um, the perfect opportunity to kind of push forward these initiatives. So what I wanna talk about next is kind of how we can actually move beyond these arrested mobilities. And um, here I'm gonna depart from my paper a little bit and try to just talk through some of the, the points I wanna make. Um, so first is the, the historical um, specificity of the United States. And the historian Rod Clare has argued that implicit in the rise of Black Lives Matter is the longstanding issue of Black mobility. That is, where can Black people go? When can they go there? This has been a fundamental question since African Americans were brought to America as enslaved people. As such, their movements and associations were always strictly monitored and in many cases prohibited by laws, by slave patrols, and other means. At the, um, after the end of slavery, this remained the case in the South, he says, and indeed in other parts of the country, well into the 20th century, through the implementation of black codes, Ku Klux Klan terrorism, sharecropping contracts, city zoning laws, segregation, and various other means. And these are, of course, the, um, the, you know, the typical newspaper images that were used in, in runaway slave ads, um, especially after the um, fugitive uh, Slave Act was passed that allowed people to follow, uh, get 
uh, patrols into, into the North to sort of bring people back into slavery in the South. So that is like the deep ingrained starting point of American inequities around mobility. Charles T. Brown refers to this um, as arrested mobility and argues that we need to center black indigenous and people of color in decision-making as well as women, LGBTQ plus and people with disabilities. So mobility justice has to be about more than simply low carbon, car-free open streets and green transitions. And so must pandemic recovery be. To move freely without facing the over-policing of the carceral state and the violence of transit racism and other exclusions has to be one of our objectives. To make safe, clean, affordable, accessible transportation for all, to include all people in planning and repair past harms. These would seem to be the sort of minimum starting points to even begin to think about this. Um, you might be familiar with the recent um, publication and PBS um, movie documentary series called Driving While Black based on Gretchen Soren's book of that name on African-American travel and the road to civil rights. If you haven't seen the PBS series, it's it's kind of streaming now it's um, on PBS, like maybe because it's Black History Month, but anybody can access it right now. It's really, it's a great um, uh, series. And what it does is it takes us back to the history of uh, African-American mobilities in the United States, both the negative side of the sort of threats and attacks and um, uh, policing and um, kind of quashing of black freedom of movement, but also the sort of dream, the allure, the, um, the desire to be on the road to enjoy the sort of benefits of American automobility and to be able to sort of take part in that, that mythic idea of um, the American road trip, uh, which also of course, after the great migration, when so many people moved to the Northern cities, many people wanted to go back and visit families in the South. And so they had to drive through particularly segregated and you know, dangerous places to get there. So the Green Book, of course, was the guidebook that gave people you know, the information on where they could safely stop while they were driving um, the roads of America. So I wanna sort of take that history and connect it to thinking about black forms of driving automobility um, today and also the risks inherent in that. So both the, the job opportunities, whether for public transit and bus drivers or taxi and Uber Lyft drivers, but the public health threat of the exposure, right, as an essential worker who's a driver um, to what that means to, to be the people keeping our, our roads running, right? Keeping our transit systems running, keeping our uh, taxi services running as well as deliveries of all kinds. So there's, there's this kind of duality of um, freedom and opportunity with kind of danger and risk that is inherent in uh, these mobilities today. So here I wanna bring in the, the group called the Untokening, uh, who I, I wrote about in the, in the book, Mobility Justice, and who at the very same time that I was writing the book and I was kind of at the end of the chapters of each book, I talk about principles of mobility justice. They were getting together and publishing what they called principles of mobility justice. And I kind of came across theirs as I was finishing the book and reached out and got in touch with people involved in the Untokening. And, um, including Adonia Lugo in particular, and their their name is um, it's about you know untokening the presence of black urban planners, black transport planners, black people in the cycling movement to say we're not just the token sort of black face in the room or person of color in the room or Latinx person in the room that we need to be centered and the question of racial justice needs to be centered in sort of thinking about cycling and green transitions and sustainability transitions in cities. So they talk about the historical disenfranchisement, disinvestment and disproportionate exposure to pollution and repressive policing in communities of color, which continue to negatively impact our collective health, wealth, mobility and security. And you know, when we put that, this was written long before the COVID-19 pandemic, 
But if you take that and think about the pandemic, the ill effects on people of color and particularly African-Americans is related to that history of disenfranchisement, disinvestment and exposure. So mobility justice demands that we fully excavate, recognize and reconcile the historical and current injustices experienced by communities of black, indigenous and people of color. Um, and you know, in their principles, they talk about, I just I pulled out a couple examples from their, um, it's called the Principles of Mobility Justice 1.0, where they talk about how safety is more than protection from cars, that identity influences vulnerability. When people live at the intersection of multiple vectors of oppression, unfettered access to mobility and public space are not guaranteed. So bodies encounter different risks and have different needs. And I think that is important now, again, when we think of the pandemic, right? Bodies encounter different risks and have different needs. That's why some people are getting the virus more and some people are dying more from it. And likewise, we can look at their um, page on environmental racism where they say environmental racism and disinvestment have disconnected many urban communities from green spaces and disproportionately created toxic environments. Infrastructure movements like bike lanes and green space often result in environmental gentrification as longtime and lower income residents are displaced by more affluent populations. So they call for addressing environmental racism without green gentrification. And again, we saw with COVID-19 that wealthier people had more access to parks, to green space, to the ability to exercise um, and, you know, to go bike riding and all of those things, uh, you know, it's dependent on where you live and the histories of segregated uh, cities. So what I want to do in, um, let's see, I'm going to take maybe just about five or 10 more minutes to just um, wrap up by bringing this to the question of, okay, so what, what do we do? How do we fix this? And how do we undesign inequity, right? If inequity is designed into our built landscape, it's designed into our cities through those histories, how do we undesign it? And Philadelphia has just come out with this new Philadelphia transit plan and it was just um, made public on Monday. So I'm kind of excited about it. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna talk about this. And um, you know, the full document is available. It's 184 pages long, but there's also an executive summary. And I'm just gonna pull out a few pieces from the executive summary here. Um, so one of the things is that, you know, it's the whole theme of it is to create, as it says on the left, a more equitable, safe, accessible, comfortable, affordable, and sustainable transit system to connect a recovered, reimagined Philadelphia. And I think those are great goals for a transit plan. And they point out that while our city has one of the most robust transit systems in the country, we need new policies, planning approaches, and investment. And we cannot fully address the systemic racial disparities among our re residents we cannot recover from the current economic and health crisis, and we cannot fight the climate crisis without investing in public transportation. So that's the kind of vision behind this. And some of the, you know, the elements they point out in kind of ar why argue why are they, you know, arguing for this is that recent travel surveys show that in Philadelphia, residents of color face commutes that are on average 12 minutes longer than white residents. And that adds up to 50 lost hours over the course of a year, if you work five days per week. And of course, for many people, you know, that's the average. For others, it's much longer than 12 minutes. And at the same time, low income riders also have to pay more for their commutes because of transfer fees and connectivity challenges and living in neighborhoods outside the city's downtown core, which has, you know, been seriously gentrifying um, in the last decade or so. So, you know, people are forced into living in places where it takes them longer to get to work and they're paying more for it and they're getting a lower income. And these transit disparities can be traced in large part, they suggest, to a bus network created in the early part of the 20th century to reflect a city that had not yet experienced suburban flight and the loss of industry. 
And also more recent developments, such as the boom in, in sort of eds and meds in West Philadelphia, where University City is, including Drexel, Penn, um, the Science Center, um, other places, and the growth of commuting patterns that don't involve center city. So most of our pool of employment and jobs is now outside the city, right? It's in that suburban, out, outer suburban ring. And so the, old, the system was designed for commuters to go to the city center and work and then go home. And that's just not the reality any longer. Um, so they have um, a set of goals and strategies and um, they include, you know, basic things like, you know, the first one, safety, reliability, and cleanliness, um, electrifying transit and trying to reduce car trips for the environment, transit to make a more equitable and just Philadelphia, which includes reforming the fare structure and creating a low income pass program and fare capping, expanding frequent weekend service, which is interesting when we think about essential workers, essential workers don't stop working on the weekend, but the transit system slows down, right? And there's like maybe an hour between uh, buses or something. And so essential workers need frequent weekend service and nighttime service. Um, ensure an equitable approach to the bus network redesign. And that was important because they involved a lot of different uh, groups in um, public meetings, in um, surveys, and in participating in this. And this plan, it was put together by, you know, a, um, a really interesting combination of actors. So it was uh, SEPTA, which is our transit agency, along with Otis, which is our Office of Transportation and Infrastructure for the city, but also the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, which spans the whole greater Philadelphia region into beyond the state of Pennsylvania, right into New Jersey and uh, parts of, of uh, uh, surrounding areas near Philadelphia. And um, also had input from, uh, I believe, New Jersey Transit and um, PATCO and you know other uh, transport actors in the region. So they, they brought together this coalition and had a lot of public input and then the other aspect here is achieving full accessibility. So that's ADA accessibility, which on our, our main lines of our subway lines and elevated the Market Frankfurt line and the Broad Street line, as well as our trolley network, we only have about 30% uh, ADA uh, compliant accessibility. So there's a huge need to expand that. And then they're calling for um, trolley modernization, which is our, you know, electrified kind of, um, what they call trolley system, and a bus network redesign to better balance the needs of the city's diverse residents, and supporting post-pandemic economic recovery with these transit investments. And then finally, there's a plank that's for kind of transit for the future, which is to reimagine our regional rail system as a frequent metro style service integrated with the entire transit network and to expand some of the high capacity um, network, which is you know, the, the subway lines and the, the, the heavier use lines. So it's a really interesting like set of goals and strategies. And just to give a couple of examples on the left, we see the um, bus corridors, um, the idea of adding um, not only bus lanes, a curbside bus lanes and bus shelters, but uh, sort of transit boarding islands where you could have sidewalks, protected bike lanes, then the boarding island. Um, and our, you know, our streets are in certain areas are very wide and have plenty of room to do that, which would help cyclists and pedestrians as well as transit riders. And I'll just give a couple more examples um, from the report or the plan. Um, the frequent weekend service, they say frequency is freedom. And here you kind of see the, um, the, the difference in um, the weekend service from Fifth and Allegheny only gets you as far as the brown blob, which is 356,000 jobs um, uh, within 45 minutes on a Sunday at noon. Whereas on a weekday at noon, you would be able to get as far as the green Blob, which brings you to 451,000 jobs. So that's one way to like sort of measure this. 
um, and you, you know, a, a lot of the jobs are in that green band and you just, you can't get there on transit on the weekends now. Um, the frequent regional rail um, service is really interesting because this is one of the big things that is a racial divide in our city, which is that the regional rail skips the sort of inner city neighborhoods. Um, it goes from like 30th Street Station and, and Center City, Philadelphia, and sort of hops out to the suburbs to higher income areas, basically, which are whiter and which are um, also uh, the service, it's more expensive. So the, the trains are much more expensive and they're not integrated with the fare system for the buses. So where we currently have these kind of six car trains um, that can carry, you know, a certain capacity per hour, they want to introduce these more frequent every 15 minute um, two car trains and would you'd be able to carry more passengers per hour. Um, and, and then integrate that with the sort of transit pass, which would then be subsidized for low income riders. That in and of itself would completely transform our transport system and make it far more equitable. Um, and then these are some of the ideas for the extensions of the high capacity transit expansion. So I just wanna kind of start to bring this to a close by thinking you know, more broadly about mobility justice and pandemic recovery, that we need to recognize past harm and ongoing inequities. We need to argue for infrastructural reparations and possibly the payment of climate debt. And I can say more about that if you want. Um, we need to shift planning power away from the dominant groups who I call the kinetic elite who have basically shaped our transit systems and our urban land use planning. We need to restrain the overconsumption of energy and excess travel, possibly by capping and, and taxing somehow, um, you know, capping personal carbon budgets. Um, you guys might, you might have seen the recent reporting this week on the, um, the huge CO2 emissions of, you know, top CEOs and, you know, Bill Gates and people who fly around on private jets and have these huge yachts and, you know, are, are talking about climate change and CO2 reduction, they could, they could start with a personal carbon budget. Um, but all of us could do that, right? We're all, um, those of us who are in the top, you know, 1% or the top 10% of income earning uh, are, have much, much more um, contribution to CO2 emissions than lower income people, and especially people in other countries. And finally, I argue that we need to create rules for commoning, sharing, caring mobilities that reduce harm, inequity, and environmental and mobility injustice. And um, I'll just end by noting that I have um, a new book coming out in March, which is in, called The Advanced Introduction to Mobilities. It's in the Edward Elgar series of advanced introductions, where I kind of look back at 10 years of mobilities research and then try to um, put it in the context of the pandemic and the pandemic recovery. And also this is the um, link, if you're able to, to follow that, to the new issue of mobilities, um, which I co-edited and co-wrote the introduction to on pandemic and mobilities. Um, and that's where you can find me on email and Twitter. Um, and I really look forward to questions and conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Scheller. Should I stop sharing this? I think, yeah, that helps to see all the gallery. And uh, if you can, please turn on your cameras. We have a little bit of connection in these strange times. Um, I did receive a question from, from Jim, so I, I let him kick it off if you want to speak yeah. up. Thank yeah, you. sure. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And forgive me if I missed, uh, missed this in your points maybe early on. Uh, I put this question in the chat as well. The prevailing thought, certainly in my mind, which might be incorrect, is that the, those who fared best through this pandemic are the ones who've just stayed in place through the whole pandemic. And I have certainly a collection of anecdotes, you know, myself of that being the case. I'm curious to know where that sits within the context of what you've been discussing. And in particular, what does, what does the notion of sitting in place being the safest, most, um, uh, uh, 
you know, this you used, I forget the word that you use, but these are the elites. I'm thinking about the stationary elites, the, right. the notion of the stationary like, elites. How yeah. does, what does this mean for mobility justice going forward? Exactly. Okay. So I use the word kinetic elite. And I didn't like define that and, and go into uh, all the definitions of things, which you, you can find more of in, in the book, Mobility Justice. But we, in the field of mobilities research, we use the concept of motility with a T to refer to people who have um, a high degree of self-determination of whether they move or stay still. And they're able to make those decisions and potentially to stay still if they want to because they control the mobilities of many other people and things. So they're able to bring things to them. So why could the people in sort of the luxury of not moving around do that? Well, it's because they could have delivery services. They could have high speed online connections. They had work that let them do that kind of, they had uh, all sorts of, workers out there working to produce the food and the services and the deliveries that allowed them to stay home. So the fact that they're still does not mean that they're not um, enjoying high motility. So it's a question of options. Um, and also many of those still kinetic elites also enjoyed the benefits of having uh, second homes or vacation homes or vacation spots, Airbnbs they could go to and sort of have a little getaway, um, which also then imposed their mobilities on much less resourced uh, areas. And that happened all over the world. I mean, we saw that in the United States, we saw it in the UK, we saw it in France, where people were able to sort of decamp to their country homes. And so there's huge inequalities in, in all of that, um, that it might appear to be a kind of, um, non-mobility but it's not actually right right and it's interesting thank you very much and what you say makes absolute sense i was thinking as you were speaking about this particularly towards the end this planning that um, maybe there's a sense that planning should be around how do you get more resources to people's homes if the future is in is in bringing it to your doorstep and people are going to move around less, then, then maybe that has to be taken into account in planning moving forward, or maybe not. Yeah, well, there's that big movement in planning for what's called the 15 minute city, um, or even the one minute city, which is, you know, where you would have a much more local provisioning of most of your daily kind of necessities. I mean, I think of the, you know, the old fashioned, um, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and, you know, that's what you would need nearby in your little area. Thank you so much. Okay, I had a couple of raised hands. Uh, Elisa Borowski and then Hanima Masani. Hi, um, Professor Schaller. Thank you so much for your talk today. Um, I'm a PhD student here in transportation engineering. And in preparation for your talk, I was just flipping through my copy of uh, Mobility <laughs> Justice, uh, which I read a couple years ago. But I had highlighted this passage that still feels very relevant um, to me and the challenges that I face as a researcher in transportation engineering. Um, so you say, rather than the mainstream narrative of an incremental challenge in daily transportation choices, supported by the emergence of new disruptive technologies leading to a transportation revolution, we can begin to imagine a broader mobility justice movement that would articulate goals around which diverse groups could coalesce and mobilize. Um, and so I, I, I relate so much to this because the tools that we're familiar with are designing choice experiments and, and model uh, estimating choice models. And those, those are the tools that we use. And I think even though there's a desire to move toward supporting mobility justice with our research, we don't know, I think, like exactly what tools to use to do that. So I was wondering as a sociologist, if you have any recommendations for like what data to collect, what data analytical tools we can use or what theoretical frameworks we could apply to start producing research that is more relevant to mobility justice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I don't know if you know the work of um, Sarah Pink, who is an anthropologist of technology. She's based in Australia at um, R RMIT and you know, she, she works 
as an anthropologist of design and with design groups and has a really great way of, of kind of thinking about kind of the co-production and co-design of te new technologies, whether it's automated cars or, you know, whatever new, you know, new communication technologies, digital technologies. But to think that when we design for things, it's not, it's not the engineer and then the designer who come up with a solution and then like drop it off to the humans and let those human factors like do their thing and like see what happens and like let's hope they they don't mess it up but actually you need the the human engagement um i hate i don't even like to call it human factors in the co-production process of the the practices and that we need to actually think of what we're designing as an ongoing practice we're designing the process we're not designing the thing because it's the people in the loop who are in part of the process who are going to be the users and the they're, they're, they're not just users they're people and people do people things and whatever we design um, we should be designing for that whole process with those people at right from the beginning well, thank you so much Dr. Mamasani. thanks Amanda uh, thank you very much Mimi um, very nice talk. Um, I'm going to pref. I have two questions. One is an easy one. The other is a more difficult one. And I'm going to preface it by saying that I'm a transportation engineer, uh, and I'm also a language purist. Uh, and so, my, so my first question is, why mobility plural? Uh, because to me, you know, we say mobility the same way we say freedom, the same way we see we say justice. Uh, it's mobility. You know, it's it's integral. And um, by kind of going plural, I feel that we're, we're losing our, our moral high ground. Mm, okay. So the reason we use the, the term mobilities, plural, in, in mobilities research is partly because we're interested in many different kinds of mobility. So we're interested in human mobility we're interested in the mobility of objects and things. We're interested in the mobility of information. And we, based on the work of John Ari, who originally um, wrote the, the new mobilities paradigm um, concept with, he would speak about also things like um, virtual mobilities, imaginative mobilities, as well as physical mobilities and digital mobilities. And so, it became natural for us to use the term plural to think about what are those intersecting different kinds of mobilities that are co-constituted. Um, I don't know if that works for you linguistically, but that's how we're thinking. Well, I mean, of it. You know, we, we, we consider virtual mobility as well. We just call it telemobility. Uh, and so we're, you know, there, there's ways of, 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 of uh, I guess, qualifying it that, that keeps that retains the 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 the, the purer I guess form of war but that's a that's a minor point that my main question is this um, you were showing us uh, Philadelphia as an example and the uh, transit you know plans for 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 Philadelphia of course uh, a lot has been appended during during the pandemic particularly transit in, in, in particular now pre-pandemic uh, transit was in sort of a structural decline, uh, meaning that it was having difficulty really attracting riders in, in many places around the world, including in the US. And uh, with the pandemic, it got hit really, really badly. And if we look at the recovery, uh, no city in the US is seeing better than say 40% recovery so far to pre-pandemic levels. And in many instances, if you look at trail, for example, it's 30%, 25%, it's very, very low numbers. If you look outside the US in cities that have recovered, we're maybe hitting 65, 70% of pre-pandemic levels. And so to, to, to what extent do you think these might have bearing on the kind of plans that you were discussing for uh, for Philadelphia, and what what should what you know should they sort of continue with these plans as if nothing happened, or should there perhaps be an adjustment uh, or reorientation? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so these these plans are are new; they're brand new. So they they come out of the pandemic uh, context, right? They're they're not like oh, we thought this up earlier, and we're just kind of going to drop it on you now. Um, and the thinking behind some of this uh, 
idea for argument for investment in our transit systems is that there's a huge opportunity here for economic stimulus through public transit investment. And, and prior to the pandemic, Philadelphia actually has fairly healthy ridership numbers. I mean, before the pandemic, we weren't, we weren't going into like a big decline in ridership. Um, we still have you know, a very high percentage of, of automobile use, of course, but we have a healthy transit system, had one, apart from the funding for it, right? It's the funding that's the issue. And this is, for me, it's a question of how the United States funds transit or doesn't, right? And we're in a, we're in a state where Philadelphia, we all know, is a democratic city. Our state is generally a Republican legislature. They've been at war with each other you know, forever over funding. So the highway system, the automobile system, the fossil fuel system essentially gets subsidized. The public transit system doesn't because it represents Democrats, it represents urban, it represents um, people of color. I mean, coming back to this racial justice issue. Um, so there's an opportunity now with Pete Buttigieg in the Department of Transportation the infrastructure bill that everybody is dreaming, you know, someday there will be an infrastructure bill passed. Can we get federal funding in place to actually properly support our, our major transit systems in our major urban areas? Because it will have huge economic benefits. It will be a huge engine of economic uh, success to invest in that transit system that we have. Like we have the good backbones and structure of, of a transit system in Philadelphia. It would be negligent to let it fail now. And also with the electrification of it, there's a huge like stimulus for clean energy investment and development, all the jobs associated with the building of the infrastructure, the electrification of the infrastructure, we can get the energy companies on board, the electric companies, Pico and all the suppliers. Um, so like, there's a lot of win-win economic reasons for doing, for doing this now. Thank you. Please go ahead, Kimberly. And, and then David Kaur. It's kind of pulling rank. Okay, was yeah. I neck? <laughs> Which, well, anyway, so, so let me just follow up on that. And um, I'm gonna ask you the very, I think, naive question of, of someone who's not in the transportation field. So I'm an environmental engineer, but I'm, I'm also pretty interested in, you know, remaking the flow of energy and materials in cities. So, so it's really interesting that this new plan comes out now and it's sort of like the magic moment, right? We're gonna seize on this magic moment, the constant discussion about infrastructure plans. So why isn't it more inspired? I mean, if I just look, if I think to um, transit in Curitiba, right, which is sort of, what are we talking, 50 years ago in BRTs and making uh, accessibility for the poor, or Melbourne, which has free zones, I guess Portland does as well, or, or Lausanne, I mean, places where you absolutely don't need an automobile. I mean, you have, so, so why is it we're not, coming up with something much more transformative if we're at this magic moment? Um, I mean, I think that is a symptom of American political culture. It's kind of, it, th there's what, what you want and then there's what's possible. And like I said, it's, it's a battle to get anything passed. And so people have kind of reduced their expectations to like, well, we'll do it incrementally. And the, the Philadelphia Transit Plan actually has three uh, kind of scenario price points, right? It begins with the, with the $45 million one, then the 75 million, and then the aspirational 95 million. And, uh, you know, the other thing is we're, we're also in a situation where Amtrak is gonna be going to the federal government for uh, Northeast corridor investments, high speed rail, or let's call it higher speed to be <laughs> frank. And, um, you know, that that's in competition with getting investment for things like bus, you know, inner city bus networks. And so there's a, you know, a lot of things have to happen. There's, you know, tunnels have to be built under the Hudson and railway lines need to be re, you know, jiggered and 
uh, signal systems need to be updated. We've got New York um, also to, to deal with. So I think Philadelphia is being, you know, somewhat reasonable in its vision here and, and trying to moderate it rather than dreaming that we could completely transform the American system and like, you know, end car culture now because uh, we're, we have a, a land use system where many people are automobile dependent mm -hmm. and any undermining of the car system is gonna take a huge amount of subsidizing as well of um, lower income automobile dependent places. Mm -hmm. I think reality is cruel sometimes. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I had, uh, I, I think I saw David Kaur and then we have Melanie Galantino. Hopefully, you can cover both in the short time we have left. You're on mute, David. I apologize. I didn't, I didn't actually have a question. Did, did I send one to you? Oh, I, I thought I saw a hand raise. No worries. Um, I, can, I can jump over to Melanie. Sorry Galantino. about that. No worries. Sure, thank you. Um, I was just gonna say, firstly, thank you. And secondly, I grew up in Upper Darby, so right in like a gap in regional rail in Philly's network. Um, so this hit close to home. And I just wanted to ask, because I grew up with regional rail, um, is there any infrastructure that would need to be changed in order to convert it to more of a Metro style? Or is it just like an issue of the service and actual scheduling of the trains? Yeah, so, okay, so the, the old time um, regional rail system is um, not, they won't change that, like the old main line and some of the old, um, what used to be called the R routes. Um, the, the, there's too much, you know, sunk into the, the rails, but there are plans to build a new um, system so that the, there's a King of Prussia uh, rail link and a, and a Norristown rail line. They, they use the word high speed. I, I don't even want to use that word for this kind of regional rail system. But then the, they would re, they basically take the outer ring sort of towns around the Philadelphia suburbs and create new light rail links connecting them. So we'd get a sort of a, a really transformative system. So this, what I was talking about was kind of the vision for the city, you know, the bus and the SEPTA system and the, and the inner city, but there's also a vision for this outer ring where many of the um, employment opportunities are so that people can sort of circle around the, reg the region more, kind of like the, the Grand Paris plan or something like that, or the, the London, um, what do they call the, the one cutting across London? So yeah, there are some bigger visions out there for those investments also, which have a lot of backing from suburban based, um, you know, companies also and employers. It's really cool to know about, thank you. I guess we're on the very, very last call now for questions. Um, Ahmad Hadabi. Yeah, I wanted to know that the, how the, it, the similar situation was, uh, uh, I guess, in Europe and the English and the French uh, had tried it differently. And uh, is there any lesson for U.S. Uh, learning from their experience to solve the issue of the mobility? So I, you know, I lived in England for 12 years, um, both in London and then up in the Northwest at Lancaster. And it's a really, really different context. And, and I'm very aware of how different it is just um, in, in so many respects, both politically and geographically, and in terms of um, how people understand the, the public transportation system and bus systems and the use of them. And they just don't, they don't have some of the the kinds of racial segregation and inequalities that are historically entrenched in land use patterns the way they are in the US. And they also are much more um, willing to sort of give up cars. So, I mean, especially poli po politically, people are much more willing, especially, you know, Paris, for example, right? They're willing to say, okay, we're gonna keep cars out of the city center and many, you know, Barcelona, uh, you know, other cities across Europe that are experimenting, not to mention, of course, all the, the, you know, Nordic countries, which have basically taxed cars, made cars very expensive, limited car access to city centers, 
put in good transit systems, put in bicycling infrastructure. England was kind of slow in a way to do it, but they're, they're sort of catching up with more, you know, with the congestion charging scheme in London and the bicycling infrastructure that's going in. Um, they're, so they're like at a whole different level. They're, they're doing like bike highways now for like longer distance travel between places. And um, English towns, many have pedestrianized um, city centers and they only allow, you know, bikes and buses and um, taxi services into the city centers. So it's just like culturally, it's a very different context and politically, I would say. So yeah, we could learn things from them, but how applicable will that be? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we, have the right political um, format to sort of borrow those lessons directly into the US context. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I don't know if Professor Scheller has a few minutes to spare or if we have to um, try to close down, but I, I do have uh, a question of my own if nobody else does right now. I can I can do a couple more minutes. Okay, I appreciate it. So feel free if you need to go and and, and jump onto the next lecture or call or anything. Um, but I was I was thinking about how we often think of the pandemic as an accelerant towards some brighter future or as fast forwarding technologies or or different types of um, ser service models or living patterns. But it also seems to have negative consequences in many areas, and there has been some recognition that labor market participation of women, for instance, has been set back maybe five or 10 years just from having to quit careers and, and kind of handle home environments. So I was wondering on the transportation side, if you see any of those more permanent shifts that have been have come about positive or negative from the pandemic and have some idea of what will stick. Yeah, so um, that's a big, <laughs> that's a yeah. big question. Um, we talk about some of these issues a little bit in the pandemic uh, immobility special issue. Um, so if you want more depth, I would recommend to look in there. But just, I mean, briefly, um, you know, I haven't focused that much today on sort of gender inequities. And of course, those are, are built into our transport system as well. And you know, many, many studies show that women's mobility patterns differ from men's um, and that, uh, you know, it varies place to place, but um, women have more, you know, trip chaining, more travel for care related work, um, less of a sort of commute to work and back again pattern. And now that that's all been disrupted by kind of this um, working from home context, women have had far more reproductive labor, right? Um, you know, keeping everyone going kind of labor, uh, unpaid, and the burden has fallen on women to do that child care, elder care, you know, shopping, cleaning, whatever. And at the same time, um, the, 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 the shift to home working, uh, I think has been hard, you know, it's been much harder for uh, women with, with children, right? For those who do have children at home, the, the benefits, like we were talking earlier about like, oh, the, the luxury to stay home, like the benefits of the kinetic elite, well, it's not as distributed to women who um, are doing childcare at home also. Um, and so there's a lot of like complexity there. And in terms of what will stick, I mean, the things I was talking about, the changes in the, the transit system would benefit all women as well, right? If there was more frequency of service, if there was more um, shelters and lighting, if there was more accessibility, right, of uh, platforms and all of those things, that all helps for the kinds of trips that women are predominantly doing. So there's there's a whole gender equity lens that could be brought to the, the same argument in a way. And I think coming out of the pandemic, hopefully women will be uh, advocating for those things that racial justice advocates are advocating for and disability advocates are advocating for and like all of those interests come together and for the children and for the elderly and for long-term COVID sufferers, right? Like all of us are gonna need a functioning um, transit system uh, that I think is gonna help make our land use patterns um, more 
fair and more sustainable and um, hopefully will also help stimulate the economy in a way that will help people with job recovery also. Yeah, that's a nice way to end it, perhaps as a broader outlook. Um, I really appreciate you coming and speaking to us and bringing us all together. We, we rarely have seminars that are bring, bring us all together. We have department or group specific seminars. Uh, so I think this was really valuable. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the great questions. And, um, you know, feel free, anybody, if you want to follow up by email, I'm happy to stay in conversation with you. <laughs>